Peter Reinfeld, nice to have you, uh, or nice to connect with you this morning. For those who don't know Peter Reinfeld, he's been a, um, an inspiration to me. He's been a friend, he's been a guide, he's been a mentor. <laughs> he's been um, uh, an ever-present reality that's always been 15, 20 years, 40 years ahead of us. <laughs> and he's uh, just been a great person who's been a, a wonderful support to our family. And um, he's also been producing books just for us <laughs> at just at the right time where we've needed, uh, we've needed support. Peter's brought out a book, which has just been spot on for us. Right. And, um, right. Yeah. So. <laughs> you're, working, you're working through that one at the moment. This was the first one. Yeah, no, we, we, we worked through following we've Jesus. Through that and you got we, some more of those. Yeah. We've just finished following the spirit. Yes. And we're halfway through uh, following the apostles vision. Right. And, and then we're going back to following you. Oh, yeah, we've done that if you can eat. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a great resource. And, and we've passed out that book to many of the leaders in, that's right. in our own organisation. Yep. Yeah. Following Jesus bookmark. Look, yeah. This, this has been inspirational and uh, the heart of our gatherings from the very start. Before you had these bookmarks. That's right. We, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, this is great. So, yeah, the Discovery in Bible actual, reading. In actual fact, I say to people, Peter, um, you know, if you don't want to buy the books, just get this bookmark. Yeah. Because that sums up, uh, uh, and anybody can do it, um, reproducible, um, multiplying process of, of Bible reading to yeah. find the gospel and to share faith. Yeah. And it's great because you can pick up a Bible anywhere. That's right. Ho hotel room. Yes. Um, op shop. You get them for free in the op shops. So that's great. Okay. <laughs> but sure. but yeah, it's just we just I wanted to thank you. I know you probably get thanked, but I, I wanted to thank you um, publicly for your amazing support because like for you and and for people like Neil Cole who've been um, just people that fly under the radar who just are so full of uh, wisdom and knowledge. It's just, we, I think we would have quit a long time ago if we hadn't have had your expertise and your support around us that just brings clarity to the cloudiness that we might be in. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. It's a great pr pleasure to be with you this morning. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Peter. Well, Peter, look, obviously disciple making, when we started this journey, I think, uh, what what at the time I'd started to read Neil Cole's book Organic Church, but um, I got asked to go to a church planning uh, workshop that the Salvos had put on, and you were one of the guest speakers. So I had all these people speak throughout the day, and I kind of connected to what they were saying. And then uh, you get up at the end, and you started to tell these stories of you know taking faith on the path of life, and I'm like, that's it. That's exactly it. That's what I've been reading. This is what this is what is this is what it's inspiring me. Wow, wow, this is great. And so we've started to connect at that point. And I just think um, ever since we've started to take faith on the path of life, I've come alive. <laughs> Our family have come alive, yes. and uh, um, the community has come alive. Um, it's something now which is just I can't see any other way of operating other than just being a genuine disciple maker within community. Now you told stories at the time, but I, I know that you have also been still uh, speaking about disciple making and teaching around the world. Do you want to talk a bit about what, what you've been doing to, um, to teach people about disciple making? Right. Um, this, con this concept of on the path of life, I think is a, a really important concept, a really important idea. Um, and I guess that idea really came very much from uh, the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because the more I went back into the story of Jesus to uh, see how he was making disciples and then gathering disciples, of course, towards the end of his ministry, he actually used the word church as reported by Matthew for the first time as he gathered disciples and the word church actually means gathering of disciples and I was very much involved in church planting and um, a church plant is a gathering of new disciples it's not transferring members from one church to another it's a gathering of new disciples 
And of course, when we think of Jesus, we think of him walking the dusty trails into the villages, um, the, the streets of the cities of the time. So on the path of life is a concept that came very much out of the story of Jesus. And, and putting faith on the path of life is, is an essential concept that comes from the life of Jesus and the approach of Jesus, his teaching, his example, his commission. Um, and, and in fostering church plants in um, many different countries, um, in Western, Northern, Central, Southern Europe, in the Middle East, in Israel, in Africa, um, some parts of Asia, in the United States, in Australia, New Zealand, etc. In fostering church plants, uh, this theme has been really a major theme. We need to engage. It really comes out of the concept of being incarnational. Yeah. So it comes out of the heart of God. When you think of the mission of God, where all of our endeavour as the followers of Jesus actually flows from, when you think of the mission of God, you've got three big principles. The apostolic principle, Jesus was sent by the Father. Apostle is one who is sent. The incarnational principle, he became one with us to live amongst us. And this wasn't just um, something superficial. Uh, he's born in Bethlehem. He grows as a little one. He's taken to Egypt. He grows up in Nazareth, a little village of 10 to 15 houses. Um, so he's mixing with his brothers, his sisters in a one room house with a dirt floor. He's miss mixing with the peasant women and the, and the girls and the teenagers, but it's all pretty small. Uh, but he can walk 10 minutes from home, sit on the ridge overlooking the plain of Jezreel and watch the busiest Roman road in the world, the Via Maris that connected mm. Africa to Europe and Africa uh, through the Silk Road to, to Asia. So he's, he's really in the mix of humanity. He's deep on the path of life. He's really connected. And so when we start thinking about disciple making, and we think about church planting, gathering new disciples, and we think of the example of Jesus, apostolic, sent, incarnational, one with us. Messianic is the other principle that comes from the heart of God, anointed by the Holy Spirit. This is pushing us down right in amongst our people. So the stories that we were sharing at the training program, the Salvation Army Training Centre, uh, was very much those stories were very much around uh, disciple making and church plants that were there in the community on the path of life, not not defined by church of the fourth century church as as it is in our buildings in our sacred spaces at our time you know so that 's where it really comes from that very important uh, underlying principle of on the path of life. And, and yeah, the thing that comes to mind, you know, um, Peter, is when in in Luke ten, when Jesus sends the the disciples out to find seekers of peace, yes. there's this idea that that God has already prepared people yes. in the community yes. for us to meet. And uh, one thing I often hear people say in a church context is, how do you how do you do this planting stuff? Like how because it seems you know pretty complex or uh, but I come back and say, no, God has already prepared people for yeah. us to meet. Um, yeah. How do you build relationships with people? Is often like, how do you do this? But it seems that God, God, uh, God is the master uh, of community development, and yes, the, the, yeah. the, obviously, other than God initiating the mission, being God being is initiating that. He is preparing, and there in Luke ten, uh, he sends these people out saying. You go to the places that I will go to. Yeah. But he's already prepared the person of peace in those places. The key person in those communities um, is a person who is there. And how do you connect? Actually, in the Luke 10 passage, he gives the very simple steps of connecting. Eat their food, heal them, tell them the kingdom of God is near. Um, the woman at the well. Uh, woman, could I have a drink of water? So he's asking for her water, um, her, her food. 
eat their food. And that creates a, a, a bond of trust. In that particular case, there was a pushback. Hang on, what are you doing talking to me? You're a Jewish man, I'm a Samaritan woman. We're not supposed to talk to each other. Well, if you knew who I was, uh, you would ask me for a drink of water and I could give you water that you could drink and you'd never thirst again. Well, <laughs> give me that water, you see. Um, so it's that um, eating, drinking, listening. And you do this so well, Peter, it's that listening to the community, listening to people, and then you're meeting need and healing. But um, in that story, you're introducing your story of your relationship with God and you're bridging quickly. And I use that term advisedly. You're, you're, not, just, you're not just in the community saying we're building friendships for years. You're actually there intentionally to take those three steps of eat, listen, uh, heal, share your story, meet the needs, and introduce God's story. Mm. Um, and that's, that's the bridge that goes from us being people of faith to connect to people. So it's very simple. Um, it's and just... And to doing it in all these different countries because the yes. principles work in every one of those countries. The principles work in every every place. Whether you're talking to... Um, a village person uh, in a culture that is so different, um, uh, food, drink, just a piece of bread is, is the moment you're offered a piece of bread or a banana or a drink of water, you know you're on the first step. I say you're on the first step of evangelism. Yeah, that's great. Uh, as soon as, uh, a bell should ring in our minds and say, that's what Jesus said. When you're given that, you're on the first step. It's right. so simple, isn't it? The first yeah. step happens at least three times a day. Isn't it? <laughs> That's right. That's right. And in every, in every culture, food and drink is cultural. Yeah. In every sing single culture. So Jesus being God, but he became fully human. And then in those first 30 years, he's, he's studying human nature. It's his preparation time. He's studying human nature. He's in a village situation. He's looking at people. He's understanding. This is the connecting point. Yeah. And, uh, and it's still the connecting point. And, and in that story of Luke 10, Jesus is saying, you're looking for a key person. Mm. Now, those key people, often, if we follow the prayer of Luke 10, verse 2, the second part, Pray for more harvesters in the harvest field because there's a great harvest to be gathered. That's interesting too, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we often, as Christians, we look at a community and we say, oh, this is tough. People here are not interested in God, right? That's yeah. our assessment. But Jesus said, there's a great number of people there who are open as mm -hmm. long as you don't carry all your own bags and carry your, all your own things. What do you mean by that, though, Peter? What do you mean by as long as you don't carry all your own bags? Yeah, Jesus said, don't carry your bag. Don't take your purse. Don't, you know, we, uh, we've got whole packages of stuff we want to give to people to convince them that they should be followers of Jesus. So we've got books and we've got leaflets and we've got pamphlets and we've got CDs and DVDs and uh, online connections and all that type of thing. We want to thrust that into the hands of people before we've actually even listened to people. Yeah. Um, and, and Jesus is saying, don't carry all that stuff. Um, Find, find, pray for um, those key people that God will open the door and, and then use these simple down to earth on the path of life principles of connecting. Um, I mean, really, that creates a lot of vulnerability for a person, doesn't it? Yes. Like, I mean, yes. It puts us in the same situation of the people we are sent to go to. Like, That's right. We've That's got right. nothing except... God and, yeah. and him in us. And, and the me, our immediate reaction is often, or oh, hang on, um, what are they going to feed me? Or, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this is going to um, be hot. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, can I drink what they're going to drink, give to me? Uh, there's all sorts of barriers. Now, Jesus didn't say you have to eat everything off their table. He didn't say, say eat them out of house and home. <laughs> um, so, you know, people will put before you on on a table as you sit with them they'll put before you things that you may know from your uh life experience they're not 
they're not the best for you or whatever. You can choose and you don't make an issue. The real issue is that you're listening to them. Yeah. You know, you take um, a, a piece of bread or you take a, a hot drink or, or just something small and you ask about them. Yeah. And when they start sharing their story, they don't realize that you're not eating everything. They don't expect you to eat everything. Yeah. So Jesus knew the culture and how to actually relate. And, yeah. and um, that gives us the opportunity of listening to people and we're sharing life now mm. and we're seeing God open doors. It's, if it's the really door doesn't interesting. open, we don't have to push our foot through the door. No, like, and, and, and what, I, what I was just going to say is, you know, when I go walk around with this hoodie on and walk yes. into people's homes, obviously, just like the cross, it's got a, it's got a connotation or there's... Yes. Um, right. And quite a few people that I've met in this community have been connected to um, an, a, an institution somewhere else in, you know, yes. in younger years, whether it was a boy's home or, right. you know, and, right. you know, the connotation of that, often can be difficult and so when you when you meet with someone who's maybe had a bad experience with our organization and i sit with them in their home and yeah. i eat and drink what they give me um that really starts to give them a different reality of what they're used to it it it's built a an environment of trust you yeah know? it's a it's a personal journey. It's like the invitations of Jesus in making disciples. The first invitation he used in making a disciple is come and see. Yeah. Uh, two of John the Baptist disciples followed Jesus asking, where are you staying here at Bethany beyond Jordan? Well, come and see. Yeah. And they spent the day with him. Yeah. The next day he finds them and he says, follow me. So the first invitation is experiential, eating food, sharing, eating some dates, some flatbread, um, talking together. Why did John say that you're the Lamb of God? Why did John say that you're the Son of God? They chatted together. By the next day, they could say, or by that afternoon, they could say to family and friends, come and see, we have found the one that Moses and the prophets spoke of, yeah. right? So the first thing that you're doing in, in sitting, even though people might have had a bad experience, and the moment they see your hoodie, and, and your name, Salvation Army, yeah. there might be a, a reaction to start with. A few triggers, not, yeah. Not by many people, will I say. No, no, obviously there's a lot, there's a very good reputation too. That's right. But, but that's you, right. You, can, but, you can get either, yeah. That's right. But if there is, or even if the uh, reputation is a good reputation, but it's been a, as a organisation of service and meeting needs but has not introduced the gospel to them yeah. um, the moment you sit and eat uh, it's a come and see come and experience yeah. uh, and they realize peter that they can trust you yeah and that trust grows as you just eat a little and you listen now i think a key is you're listening because mm -hmm. if the second step is heal it means you've got to listen on the first step to know what you need to heal you know? what does it mean to heal like, what does it mean if you're just listening? How, how is that healing? Well, I think listening in itself is healing. Um, you, will, you will have had experiences where you ask a person as you take a little drink, even a drink of water or you eat a banana, you say, tell us about how things are going. And they talk and they open up. And they talk and talk and talk and talk. And you really don't say too much at all. You're just listening. Yeah. And then maybe you say, well, we could catch up again and we can have another chat together. And they'll say, oh, it's been so interesting listening to you. And you think, I didn't say anything. <laughs> well, well, they I often did. say it's not what we expected. It's not what no, we expected. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, the fact that you're listening is healing in itself, mm. right? And then as you listen to people's stories, healing is encouragement, um, support, uh, meeting needs. Uh, so we're not always taught, when we use the word healing, we sometimes think of a person who has a serious illness or cancer or something like that. They've received a bad diagnosis, but there's, there's, uh, there's mental health issues. There's spiritual health issues as well as physical health issues. Mm. There's emotional health issues. And so some support, some encouragement, some, uh, insight, etc. You see, that is all healing. Yeah. As well as saying, um, 
sharing your story just briefly. I, I sometimes will just share my story in the midst of this. I'll say, hey, sometimes I just drop it in. I'll say, hey, I don't know whether I've told you. I'm sure I haven't. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. I left home when I was 15 because there was no money around. I needed to go and work to get myself through school. So I never stayed at home again. I got work from the time I was 15, worked my way through school, high school, and then through my um, postgraduate graduate and postgraduate studies myself. Um, but, you know, when I, I left home at 15, but when I was 16, I had to make the decision. Am I going to be faithful to the God of my parents or am I going to go my own way? And I decided to trust God. Mm. And what I can tell you, Peter, is that whether, I'm, whether it's been on a mountaintop experience or a valley, God is with me. Yeah. And he's interested in you too. Yeah. So I introduced my story like that because that's part of healing. I mm. keep it very short, just a few sentences, no more than a minute and a half, two minutes. And I'm bridging to the fact that, you know, God cares about you too. Yeah. So... The brokenness might be physical brokenness or emotional or spiritual or, um, um, you know, relational, um, and you're bringing some healing. I introduce God and say, you know, I, I can I could pray with you as well. Would you like me to pray for you? Yeah. God, I know that you're interested in this friend of mine. Just help them. Thank you. I don't close my eyes. I don't make religious speech. I just pray directly for them. And and you can see the healing that actually bring comes into their lives as a result of that. You know? Yeah, and, and it's and it's beautiful because God builds on that. Like I was chatting That's with a right. lady yesterday who I've been connecting with for a, a long, probably about three or four years. I've yes. been working with her son. And yeah. um, she came out and she just said, you know, I really want to connect with your with you and your community. Um, yes. I've been working in this area with some spiritual people and they are really the really beautiful spiritual people as well, which speak about the same thing you've been talking about. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, God, God brings people around other people. We don't That's even have right. to do that. That's like right. God, God builds his community. And, and, and the, the, the inquiry that a person like that is making is, mm. uh, and sometimes we can miss it because we're so used to our religious jargon. Yeah. But, the person like that is actually on the path of life inquiring about your faith. A seeker of peace. <laughs> A seeker of peace. Yeah. 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 So um, as you engage with people in this way, you, you're keeping your eyes open for these key people that Jesus spoke of. Yeah. And when we look at his ministry and the Apostle Paul's ministry, this person of peace is often a person who is receptive to the Spirit of God. Um, the person is is often welcoming, hospitable, um, is a person of uh, reputation, good or bad. Yeah. Um, and uh, when they become a follower of Jesus, they they have enormous influence. Yeah. Um, amongst their in their relational stream, in their connection, whether it's yeah. family or workplace or tribe or or group that they kind of hang out with. Um, and they have that influence then to uh, invite others into relationship with Jesus and a, and a walk with him as well. You know, so, another, another interesting thing I've noticed, Peter, is um, it's almost like the people, well, not almost like, it is like the people of peace, uh, some of them are also people who are deeply have a deep connection to the past of yes. the region. Yes. Um, and the, so some of the people that we're finding uh, have, have a history in the region who um, that has um, connected to an, in, uh, an indigenous story along the way, whether it was through a massacre or something like that. And it's almost like God is, is trying to highlight a story that it's not only about the now, it's about righting the wrongs of the past. And these people are actually key players that God has prepared in the story that, uh, yeah. that will be helpful in bringing reconciliation, reconciliation. and restoration yes. to the region. Yeah. And that's, I, that's blown my mind. <laughs> and, and what you've also put your finger on there, I think this is really important, is that in the... Um, in the New Testament, in the life of Jesus and the life of the apostles, 
those who would be identified as people of peace, they did not become itinerant apostles. Mm. They stayed in their place. Yeah. So the woman of Samaria, don't ever read of her then becoming one who followed Jesus around with the male apostles. Jesus had female uh, women traveling with him, Luke chapter eight, as well as men traveling with him, who he was equipping. But the woman of Samaria, she stays in Samaria right? The demon possessed man who Jesus delivered on the other side in Decapolis, Jesus says, you stay. Mm -hmm. His influence was there, right? His story was there. His connection was there. And you could go in Paul's first missionary journey, Sergius Paulus, the uh, um, governor of Cyprus, he becomes a follower of Jesus. He stays there Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, they head off up through Famphilia up to central Anatolia to take the gospel to his family region. But Sergius Paulus actually stays. So the, the, um, the person of peace, this key person, as you've said, as, as you've identified, often has deep connections in the local community. Yeah. And in our situation today, they're the ones who can bring about reconciliation. They can bring about uh, a deeper understanding of the long story of a region and have influence for the gospel and for the kingdom in that, in that environment and in that place. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a really interesting key that we, that we have in the uh, understanding of, of the person of peace um, character. Well, the, the weird thing for us, though, um, Peter, even Di and I, like, we are, we are connected historically. And I was born in England. Right, <laughs> right. So you have connections right there. Yeah, so my, yeah. my, my ancestor that got sent to Australia as a convict yeah. Yeah. Um, came to, after he got his ticket of leave from Tasmania, came through the Bellarine Peninsula and settled in Footscray and, and right. was in the whole of the Western districts as a shepherd. So, yeah, yeah. And they were the ones that were doing the work of killing Indigenous people. Yeah. Um, and so my, I'm a descendant of the ancestor, uh, you know, of the, of the children that were left behind right. in England. Right. So it wasn't yeah. until 1988 that we came out here. And yeah. then Di also is connected to the matron of the female factory in Tasmania. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and they had a connection with the Bellarine Peninsula too, but none of us, Neither, like, neither of us knew this. Right. And it's like when we put our hands up to go follow Jesus, God sent us here. Yes. And yes. we had no clue that we would be also able to have an opportunity to connect into our past and say, hang on, what happened back here? Yes. And, ha and what can we do to change that? Um, and I think it's fascinating. Like yes. uh, it proves that God is real. It proves yes. that we're valuable. It proves yeah. that we're um, in included into his mission. Uh, it's yes. beautiful. Yes. And, you know, back to some of the stories that we shared, I'm sure that we shared at the time we first met. Yeah. Um, one that uh, really features in my mind uh, is the story of a businessman and his wife, Zoimo, on the border between the Czech Republic and Austria. Yeah. Um, and uh, a church planter, uh, Martin Vaselli. Uh, he and his wife moved into the area. They were connecting with people. They, they found this businessman and his wife um, who had a strong commitment to Jesus. He's a, uh, he, he's a well-known business person, contractor in the community. Yep. And, uh, and he says to Martin, look, you know, we don't, we don't need a whole lot of meetings. We just need to get deeply connected to the community. And uh, so he bought a historic cafe right in the centre of Zormo. Zormo is a beautiful city, little city. It's probably even more beautiful than Prague. Wow. Now, Prague is known historically as one of the most beautiful cities of Europe. Very beautiful. City. Uh, but the city of Zormo is kind of a miniature Prague in a sense, and right. with its character. And, and so he buys a cafe in the centre, uh, refurbishes it as a historic little cafe, uh, a cafe porta, the door, the door cafe, um, and he has a couple of offices and an upstairs eating area as well, uh, where Martin had an office, and and this is open seven days a week, right. um, and it's run as a commercial cafe, uh, and but 
for worship. They started a worship in this cafe um, each weekend in the morning, but the cafe is still open. So they have uh, people coming in. Oh, can we have a coffee? Could we have a meal? Yes, but we have a function downstairs. We have upstairs. Um, and so the people would be ushered upstairs and then uh, when it came to pay, they'd say, look, the function is covering your, your total cost of coffee and meals today. <laughs> um, and if you want to listen in downstairs, you can sit by. Within two years, that cafe could not hold all the new believers. Yeah. Right? But cool. already by that time, um, they were equipping families to take their faith back to their communities around Zoimo and in the villages nearby. So you have households now that are organizing walking groups and uh, support networks and discovery Bible reading groups, etc. And eight or nine of these started. Uh, so, so then it got to the place where only once, once every month would people come into the cafe and it was absolutely crowded for worship time. The other time they were worshiping back in their networks. So after, after about four or five years, the businessman says to Martin, hey, I think this cafe has served its purpose as far as sowing the gospel seed in the community. We sell the cafe and we buy 100 metres down the road, another facility which is our community type of centre, but we're not going to all gather there for a worship service uh, each weekend. Um, we will come together there and that will be our training support place and we'll have other things for the community there, but we'll multiply the house groups out in the community. So there is an illustration of how yeah. a person of peace, a key person in the community, mm. um, the, the church is not beholden to him. Mm. He's not owning the church financially. Yeah. Um, the church hasn't even bought any property but they're not held to him because they pushed it back into the community on the path of, path of life. It's one illustration of how this can actually uh, happen. Um, wow. So, uh, and we shared some of those stories when we were together uh, some years ago at Salvation Army Training College. Yeah. Um, but those illustrate what is taking place. At the present time, or over the last three years, I've been doing a lot of work in the Pacific Island countries yeah. as well. And um, I was in Papua New Guinea until March 15, which is the date when Australia went yeah. into lockdown, lockdown. <laughs> and uh, flew back to Australia, got home six hours before the lockdown was imposed. Um, and of course, immediately Papua New Guinea was locked down as well. And um, the churches could not meet uh, in more than, 100 people or 50 people. Provinces were locked down from each other, so they couldn't move from one province to another. They couldn't carry their, their goods, their trade down the Highlands Highway, etc. cetera. But um, this has now multiplied into literally thousands of new discussion groups. Right. Because we had spent three years carefully laying the foundation of Jesus' disciple-making, multiplying method, uh, church planting out of the New Testament of the book of Acts, following the spirit, what we read there in yeah. the book of Acts, how church was um, defined by the apostles and what it looked like founded on the principles of Jesus in Matthew 16, Matthew 18. And, and, and these folk have just taken it mm. and they've taken this uh, approach of discovery Bible reading because they've said, well, anybody can do that. You don't even have to be able to read or write. You can remember the process, yeah. get someone else to read, get someone else to read it a second time, <laughs> tell the story. We can remember the questions. And so in some parts of Papua New Guinea in the Eastern Highlands, Simbu provinces, um, about four and a half thousand churches have just sprung up like that. Yeah. But these are not tied to buildings. These are meeting under trees, in houses, under houses, in school classrooms, uh, etc. So it's on the path of life. The movement has formed just around transform lives. That's right. That's like right. What, um, like what Paul talks about in Galatians, you know. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, some of the principles have come out of, I know the book following the Apostles' vision is a little more difficult to read than than the others following Jesus or following the Spirit because it's it's digging in and asking 
Um, but the digging in is important. You know, yeah. we, we just yeah. we just read Galatians this week, that yeah. whole chapter, uh, and uh, it's just amazing. Um, yeah. And, and right. what a stumbling block us religious people can be to the process of the gospel. Like it was just, a, it was beautiful to be able to yeah. say, you know, yeah. for us to launch the movement out of a organization, we really have to let go of a lot of things. And that's uh, right. That's right. And uh, because once we start looking at the movement concepts of um, the gospels, the book of Acts, and then the epistles, mm. and the book following the apostles' vision is digging into the epistles to say, how could Paul write? How could he write the letter to the Galatians in yeah. Southern Galatia? And I take an early date for the writing of Galatians. But how could he write that deep theology to a bunch of churches that are scattered across this pagan territory? Most of the people were total pagans 12 months before. Yeah. And yet he could, he could write about those things, you see. and. Uh, and what, so what do we find in the letter about how he made disciples? What does he say about what he said, what he did? How did he do it so quickly? Complete churches planted. Um, and you realize he was working on some really significant principles. Mm. Um, this is pre-institutionalization of church, pre-Constantinian type church, which many of our churches reflect, yeah. pre any kind of, uh, church building or structures like we have yeah. um, but what principles was were, were they actually following and you find some really significant principles that they were building on yeah. now today of course when we face a movement and people start sharing their faith on the path of life then some of us become concerned hey that's <laughs> not in harmony with the policies that we have in place <laughs> How are we going to protect this? <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, after the day yesterday, and I was, I was uh, on Zoom, spent a full day with churches in uh, Dili and Timor-Leste, uh, Timor-East, um, yesterday. Then I've got some emails saying, well, if that does happen, <laughs> um, how are we going to control it? How do we, how do we choke it? <laughs> <laughs> That's... Exactly the questions I got this morning in, yeah. in written form, asking me, could I please respond to that? And could I come back for another uh, session to look at some of those questions? But it was really, how can we control this? Do you, what, do you think what that's people... why Jesus says, go with nothing? Yes, that's you know right. Why he says, go, go with no, even with no institution represented. That's right. It's not about trying to maintain anything other than the kingdom of God. That's right. The community. Yeah. Yeah. Now there were systems, yeah. um, you know, like uh, Neil Cole with his organic church. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's pointing out that movements need structure. Yes. Take, take our bodies as, as the yes. example of an, uh, an organism. Yes. Um, and, um, and it's very complicated and there are systems and there are processes. But the structure is defined by God. That's right. Not, by, not by an institution like God. God. Yeah. His order out of the, his fruit of the spirit, you know, he, that's right. he the, raises communities and different yes. gifts and skills. That's right. So when you look at, at Paul, he's doing mission out of the heart of God with these mm -hmm. underlying principles of sent by the father, um, living life on the path of life, incarnation, um, spirit uh, anointed, spirit ordained. Uh, this is the, these are the controlling principles of this mission those are the main principles of the concept of missional um and then then you see he's building the team out of the harvest yes he's gathering what is needed to support this mission out of the harvest yes he's taking the leaders for each of his church plants that what what i call the natural leaders yes so he's building a, he's using the natural leadership systems the oikos or the ecos Yep. which is the household system. Yep. Lydia is the leader of her household. Mm. The jailer is the leader of his household. Yep. Jason is the leader of his household. Stephanus is the leader of his household. Gaius is the leader of his household. Phoebe, the leader of her household. So he takes the natural leader, and then you see him also um, leaving people as coaches, as mentors. Yep. 
So he leaves Luke in Philippi for how long? Four or five years, right? He leaves uh, Timothy and Silas in Thessalonica uh, for a short period of time. Um, he sends people back to Ephesus. Uh, he makes some visits himself, not a lot of visits, but he makes some visits. He sends key people to be mentors. So there is a system there, yeah. but it's not a system that is trying to prop up an institutional church. Yes. And that's the difference. Yeah. See, one of the things we're facing, the difference between mission on the path of life in the New Testament and what we're often faced with today is in the New Testament, it was the mission of God. Yeah. To achieve the task of multiplying disciples for the kingdom of God. Today, it's often the mission of the church. What do we do to sustain the system that we have? And the reality we know of the mission of God is that God speaks to everyone who's involved. That's right. That's and, right. And it could be in, oh, call this person, go here. Hit. That's right. That's and then right. the reality of the church is that the leader says, this is what's happening. Yeah. Now, one of, one, of the, one of the factors that we've got to keep in mind is that the Church of the New Testament was not an employing agency. Yes. Right? It was not a business. Yeah. So there was not a matter of an office with accountants and people being paid wages and that type of thing. Yep. Um, uh, whereas that is often what we think of when we use the word church today. We yep. think of... Uh, the employment of the church, the business structure of the church, etc. So there's a big difference um, with those with those issues. But the challenge is how can the how can the movement of God um, at local level, which is where church really happens, how can the movement of God be um, driven by the Spirit um, and sustainable and be a multiplying movement? Uh, without locking itself into all of the frames, often driven by processes where where disciple making is not the the high point on the agenda, and often with the best of intentions too. You know, no question. People yes. just people just don't know. I mean, we had this situation recently, Peter, where um, our leaders, which, which is which is really weird because it's like um, God has raised up an APES team and it hasn't yeah. like, we haven't gone, oh yeah, we're trying to start an APES team. It's like, yeah. you can just see that all these different leaders have all these different qualities. And they said to us the other day, we are going to be the ones to help the movement go to the next level. Yes. I'm like, whoa, hang on, hang on. That's what Jesus said. He's yeah. going to raise up people from the harvest. Yes. Yes. The people yes. from the harvest will be the ones that take it to the next level. And we're yeah. like, oh, wow, this is awesome. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And, and you see all of those, those people giftedness that you actually need. Yeah. Um, the, the people of the sent ones, the people with the spiritual discernment, the people with the evangelistic edge, um, the, the people who are the, the the shepherds the carers and the people who are the teachers you've got all of that in the mix of these people so under the spirit of god they can really take that to the next level yeah the the irony too peter is that a lot of these people um would not be able to be members in our institution today because of the the tight rules or restrictions that we have and things like that they just wouldn't they wouldn't be able to be them because of of who they are and um but then just to see that God is using them yes. to birth something new out of this is yes. just beautiful. Um, then, then I think this is where you're defining um, the whole movement by the heart of God yeah. uh, rather than by um, policies that are important, Yes, uh, that we've learned have been important, but you're seeing that the edges of the movement um, are far more blurred because you're actually cultivating what we could call a center cent a centered set movement. Yeah. That is, uh, everybody is centered on Jesus and what he has accomplished and done and through his presence by the Spirit, you're centered upon him. Um, the bounded set 
is more where you're defined by uh, policy compliance, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's going to be always some of that because you're going to have that in the way in which you operate yep. um, your op shops and your uh, care centres and that type yep. of thing. There's going to be the policy compliance and regulations, yep. but the challenge is always to keep centred set. Yeah. So you ask, how do these people of influence, the, the people of peace, who don't fit into the bounded set, how do they, how do we still see them as part of this movement because they're part of the kingdom of God? Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a life, that's on the path of life question. Right? Well, and the beautiful thing is I don't have to answer it. <laughs> no, that's right. Because <laughs> they're, they're the ones that are working it out. <laughs> that's right. That's right. No, you don't have to. And that's, that's where um, you live, you live in that tension mm. uh, because you keep, you keep that um, policy compliance, all that, that, that has some important dimensions, but you have the other dimension of an organic process, the kingdom of God, that is the mission of God. So yeah. you don't have to have all the answers. You yeah. just got to hold some of that intention and not lock it all down. Yeah. 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 That's great. That's so encouraging. So encouraging to hear that. So did you say you're putting out another book about that? Um, I'm doing another book at the moment. It's just about finished on if you're thirsty, you can be spirit filled. So yeah. it's about the, the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit yeah. and kind of acts as a, as a, it's a, it's a central feature of the, of the whole journey. Did you um, say that there was one after following the apostles vision? No, there's not um, another one specifically of that series. We've yeah. Well, cause I, I'm finding so far, I mean, we're only up to like the third, the third or fourth, um phase is it called phase? Yes. yeah uh, yes. and um already it's it's blowing our minds um right. and it's like god is just affirming what he's doing here and yes. um and one of the one of the big things and you would be up to that in in the book at the present time in this one and that is where i'm discussing about the concept of theological thinking yeah now that sounds very um eyebrow <laughs> eyebrow but it's actually um, something that all of us are involved in, every single yeah. person. Um, and when you look at Paul's writings through that, you realise his theology was actually very, very simple. Yeah. Um, and he just keeps coming back to this point. Jesus died for you. Jesus arose. So that's mm. Calvary. Yeah. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father and he's come by the presence of his Holy Spirit. That is Pentecost. So those two historic events are defining for his faith and whatever he faced he just came back to those points and the salvation army's motto is blood and fire which is those two things yeah every in pentecost so, yeah, yeah i i spoke at a uh, regional meeting in cairns i think it was and that was held that was last year that was held in salvation army center i'm sure it was in cairns i've been to so many places yeah and i saw these great banners you know just that, such good banners about this, about mission yeah. and uh, the side making movement, with it, blood and fire. And I said to the, I said, it was a large uh, group of people gathered there, you know, many hundreds for this regional meeting. And I said, we couldn't get a better theme uh, because these two historic realities of Christian faith, Calvary and Pentecost, yeah. um, are the defining um, realities that are like the the rule and faith of faith and practice for us as believers. Yeah. So we test everything through those. That's the heart of the mission of God. Um, so that 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 is really important to get a handle on that. And when you see that um, early, then you read the New Testament in a different way. Yeah. The Calvary and Pentecost changed their interpretation of scripture, changed the way they related to their cultural taboos yep. um, and their cultural heritage, mm. um, reinterpreted the way they uh, understood God. Mm. Um, so these are, these are broad sweeping in their impact. And well, I, and I think too what's powerful for us is reading, reading the 
uh, text in the context of our little community, you know, yes. of all these people from outside of church traditions who are all learning different. It's, it's, I'm kind of connecting into the ancient text going, wow. Cause I often read, you know, those books, those letters and you think like the church he's writing to is like the big yes. massive cathedral down the corner. And you got to remind yourself, no, actually it's this, this, this new community of people trying to work out what this, what this salvation yeah. message means for them. Yeah. And, and they're in um, a, a small city or a large city or a village or a town, and they don't have a single um, church property in town. There's no cathedral. There's no basilica. There's, there's no Christian school. There's no printing press. There's no Bible. And they're wrestling with faith in that environment. Yeah. And, uh, and so it brings it right down to the path of life where you're at. Yeah. 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 That's great. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. And and I think it's the experience, isn't it? It's the experience of the gospel that, yes. that um one thing I found really helpful was the you know the complete Jewish Bible. It yes. puts the great it puts the great commission there in terms of go into the world and immerse people in the reality of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and wow. then teach them to obey my uh, my commands. Yes. And for yes. me that that took the whole idea of a, you know, a, a program event of dunking someone in water to actually yeah. being about immersing them in a mysterious reality. Yes. Um, yes. And I think when I read the text now, I just see that that mysterious reality was oozing out everywhere. Yes. And it was in that context, people started to follow. Um, yes. And that's yes. what I've seen in this community. As people start to see God, they can't explain what's going on but they can sense his presence. They can, right. They're can. they intrigued by whatever it is. That's where the movement is really starting to gain momentum because That's people, right. people That's are right. seeing that Jesus is real. Yes. He does care about them. Yes. Um, and he sends others as, around them too to reinforce the message. So it's yeah. Yeah. beautiful. And, and your, your, your it, faith is being seen in the reality of life. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone sees it. I see it. They see it. Right. Their friends see it. And it's like, oh, and that's hence the relational strain. That's right. They that's family right. go, what's going on? Yes. <laughs> weird. What's going on? How did that possibly happen? Like, how that's, right. Yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, great to talk with you. Really great to talk yes. to you. Mate. Thank yes. you for your time today. It's just, I, it's, I knew it was going to be super encouraging and, um, it has been, and I know you're very busy, and I really appreciate that. It's okay. Take this hour out to chat. So, thank you so much, and God bless you. And yes. I look forward to seeing more of those photos on your page of all those cheeky yes. people all around the world that are starting to follow Jesus. And uh, yes. yeah, yes. it's great. God bless you. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Peter. Right. Oh, ten o two. What a great time to finish. <laughs> Raise them up, Lord. <laughs>